Um, my name is Emma Davis Rodak. I'm 17 years old. I use she, her pronouns. And fun fact about me, my parents got divorced when I was eight. So being 17 now, I've spent the majority of my life lugging a bag over to a different parent's house for the weekend, having two Christmases, and finding homes in two different households. I honestly don't really remember it any other way. But I don't hold any resentment towards my situation. I love my non-nuclear family. I love going out to breakfast with my dad in snowstorms and watching Jane Fonda movies with my mom and sister. I love the little families I have. I love my stepmom, I love my stepsister, and I love my mom's boyfriend. They're all family. The last thing I want any of you to take out of this talk today is that non-nuclear fa non -nuclear families are bad, because they aren't. They're perfectly normal, and I'm sure each and every one of you here today have unique challenges presented to you by your familial structure, whether it's nuclear or not. However, I'm here today to talk about the specific challenges that are presented by belonging to a non-nuclear family. Personally, I can only speak from the perspective of coming from a divorced parent family, but the term non-nuclear really encompasses any structure differing from two married parents raising children. Additionally, I really do believe that the extended support I plan on discussing today must reach to any child living in a familial structure differing from the norm. Moving into the larger picture a little bit, we've all heard the statistic that 50% of marriages will end in divorce. We're used to this, and it's normalized, which is okay. But personally, this is something I internalized really negatively. I would see all of these people around me and assume that they were in similar or more challenging situations to mine, and I didn't see any of them complaining. I would think to myself, this is so common. If all of these people aren't complaining about this, why am I? In response to this, I began trying to be more honest about my emotions regarding my situation with my parents. I made some progress in this and understanding that I'm somebody who needs to feel really grounded in my surroundings, and this is why days when I had to switch houses or had a last-minute schedule change were really difficult for me. However, most of my parents still came from more traditional family structures, and the feeling that I was annoying them when I wasn't as enthusiastic about plans on days when I had to switch houses or when I needed a little bit of extra time for self-care after a schedule change made me feel ostracized from them. I felt separate from my friends for a reason that I thought was just me being dramatic. It wasn't until one of my friends who also came from a divorced parent family and I sat down and talked about things that I began to understand that my emotions relating to my situation were valid. We sat down and talked for hours about things that I had always just thought were small inconveniences and how they actually impacted us in a large way. After this talk, I began to think about the things that I had always pushed down and invalidated. How was pushing these things away contributing to the negative mental health issues I was experiencing? I began to understand that so many of the emotions that I didn't understand or wouldn't let myself feel were actually valid and related to issues um, rooted in issues related to the continuing effects of my parents' separation on myself. Feeling uprooted, issues with finances, anxiety about leaving my house for more than a few days at a time, and keeping my guard up. All of these things are normal, valid, and healthy reactions to changes in familial structure, and if I had understood that, I would have saved myself from a lot of self-deprecation. For so long, I pushed away any understanding of these emotions, thinking that people would think I was just being dramatic. Honestly, even writing this talk, I stopped myself so many times because of this little voice in the back of my head telling me that people were going to invalidate things, that people were going to think I was being oversensitive, and that this was really just too common of a problem for it to have a big impact on people. However, Understanding these emotions is why I'm so comfortable with myself today. I'm comfortable validating my own emotions, and I'm also comfortable acknowledging when things are difficult for me. I'm comfortable understanding things on a larger scale, and I know that people survive and learn to be happy after things much, much worse than the ones that I've experienced. These concepts aren't mutually exclusive. It's possible to acknowledge common traumas while also understanding that people's struggles differ in severity. It's possible to look for a way in uniting all common struggle while also understanding that people undergo their own challenges in unique ways and that all of these ways are valid, necessary, and worthy of support. This is why talking about things that may be uncomfortable on a large scale is so important. When I was writing this talk, I thought about editing it so many times to take out discussions of my own mental health or personal experiences, but then I realized that it just wouldn't have the same impact. And this is why personal narratives are also super helpful in this conversation, because they help create the understanding that no emotion is invalid, no reason for emotion is too common, and no person is unworthy of support. And these are the understandings that we have to have in order to pave the way for better resources for children from non-nuclear families. 
I'm going to move back into the larger picture to talk about solutions. So you've all heard my story. Thank you for listening. Um, but we need to talk about the larger impacts of inadequate support for children from non-nuclear families. So some of the more horrifying statistics depict that children from single parent and blended families are three times as likely to need psychological help as children who come from nuclear families, and that children from divorced parent families are two times as likely to commit suicide than children who come from nuclear families. These statistics, paired with the fact that over 50% of children in the United States right now are living in non-nuclear families, make these facts even more pressing. If over 37 million children in the United States alone are in situations that make them more vulnerable to mental health issues, why are we ignoring the support that they need? If we continue to neglect these children, how will they grow up happily if they even get the chance to grow up? We love talking about youth involvement and youth voice as we should, it's super important. But we can't acknowledge the potential our generation has without also acknowledging all of the barriers that we have to accessing it. If we're able to understand these barriers, then we can create comprehensive, realistic solutions to uplift our generation into adulthood and nourish everything that we have to offer the world. We need a larger network of support groups for children from non-nuclear families, especially in areas where residents don't necessarily have the means to access costly services. And they don't only need to be limited to children of divorce, they can expand to anybody who feels negatively impacted, isolated by their familial structure, but they're urgent. With mental health issues on the rise and an increased amount of services available, it's imperative that we're inclusive in all of our understandings of the reasons that people need help. No reason is too common. In terms of support, I was lucky. The privilege class I reside in gave me access to things like family therapy and escapes like summer camps. And I'm so grateful to the access to these resources and support that I had that really helped soften the blow. However, even with these resources, I still felt like I was missing validation. So I'm going to tell a story. At my elementary school, we had weekly folders that we would take home once every week on Wednesday. And I remember seeing that some of the other kids got to take home two weekly folders to take them home to both of their houses. And that's how I knew that they had separated parents and they were like me. Now, this isn't something that I would have noticed or even thought about if I came from a nuclear family. And this is why this quickly became one of the only senses of community that I felt with my peers who were also undergoing similar challenges. And I look back on this weird, specific memory and think about how beneficial it would have been to me if that sense of community was actually unlocked. And if I understood that some of the kids who are taking home one weekly folder were taking them home to a single parent family or living with a guardian. This sense of community and validation is what I feel would have really helped me during my tough times. And I think about how I've created really unique bonds with my friends who are also from non-nuclear families. So I think about these bonds, and then I think about the kids in my neighborhood who are running around and going to go to Wines and have the same teachers that I did, and I want to give them what I didn't have. If we're able to create the sense of support, maybe even just starting at one elementary school, we're unlocking a new sense of community. And with the way that our schools are structured and how the same group of people is generally carried with you through elementary, middle, and high school, it wouldn't even need to be formally facilitated by a teacher after elementary school at all. So students would start in a support group in elementary school that would be formally facilitated by a teacher. And then after elementary school, it wouldn't necessarily be like a weekly meeting, but they would still have that same group of students that would be there to support them, they would have them to lean on, and they could also have them to reach out to other people who were possibly undergoing similar situations. We would be creating a new sense of community and shared support for all of the children in Ann Arbor Public Schools. Growing up in a non-nuclear family can be really challenging. And when you don't have adequate support, those challenges are only amplified. But here's what can also happen. You can learn self-love from the pride you get from getting yourself through tough times. You can learn to be more empathetic and care for others more deeply from giving and receiving support to and from your peers. And you can learn to be more prepared for the challenges that face you, because you've already been through a lot. There's potential for a more resilient, caring, and empathetic generation to be born from non-nuclear families. They just need our support to get there. If we're able to create these resources and expand support to children from non-nuclear families, we're uplifting a population of our generation that has traditionally been downtrodden. Also, by doing this, we're unlocking a plethora of ideas and perspectives that we haven't heard before. And if we can do this in Ann Arbor Public Schools, then we're sending out a message to all of the children and families in our district that they have inherent value and importance, not only in our school system, but in our world. Thank you.